I'm so thankful for the opportunity to sing praises, to worship you, to walk with you, to love you, to experience life with God. Father, thank you for the work that you're doing in each and every one of our lives. Father, if there's someone here that doesn't know you in a personal and intimate way, God, I pray this morning that they would respond to the prompting of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you'll be with Scott as he brings the word to us this morning. Father, speak through him. Father, I pray that you would touch our hearts with the reality and the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Uh, my name, as I said, is Scott Slade, and you met my family. Uh, by all means, ask our kids questions about what they're excited for with our mission trip, because they've been talking about it. They're excited to get to have that opportunity. But as we go forward, I wanted to, to kind of talk about the idea of parenting and marriage, right? I don't have the most experience in the room, I'll be honest, okay? But I've been married for almost 13 years, and you know what I've learned? I've realized that there's always seemingly pressure, right? Pressure that's kind of put on us, whether it's making small decisions for kids, whether it's walking with my wife through hard decisions, job changes. Ten years ago, going from a, a full-time job working for an oil company to do full-time ministry, that was a big life shift that required a lot of trust, but it was also a lot of pressure for us because people are looking to us to be the ones who kind of lead our kids. They're looking to me to be the one that leads my family well. And as I was thinking about that this week, Ray said, hey, you can preach about whatever you want. And I said, okay. And I started praying and I started seeking God and he brought me back to 2 Kings chapter 19, looking at the King Hezekiah, who was a person who honestly dealt with some serious pressure, right? As he looked at his life, he looked out over the, the nation and he was under attack. Now, it may not be literal war in our lives, but the pressure that we walk with does kind of lead us to a place of, of trusting God. Are we able to step into pressure, whether it's war, whether it's decisions in our everyday life, whether it's walking with our spouses, our children, our coworkers, different people, are we able to face those pressures with a right heart and a right mindset? Do we handle them in a manner that is honoring to God, or do we kind of just get by? There's a, there's a saying that I don't, I tried to figure out where it started, and there's a few different people that maybe have coined it, but that's not the saying, <laughs> right? The saying is that when, it, the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? We've all heard that, and the reality is I think that's completely wrong. When the t going gets tough, I think we need to go to our knees. We need to enter into the presence of God and realize in our weakness, He is made stronger. So if you guys have your Bibles, um, I would go ahead and encourage you to to open up to 2 Kings, and we're going to be looking specifically at verses four, uh, chapter 19, verses 14 through 19, and then we're going to jump to the end of the chapter and look at 35 th or 32 through the end. But before we go there, we need to understand more of the background before we read this. So if you flip back a page or two, page 18, or page 18, chapter 18, is the setting. And there's a statement made about Hezekiah in verse 5 of chapter 18. He says, He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commands that the Lord commanded Moses. It's a pretty bold statement to say that in all the kings of Judah, there was none like him before or after. When we walk in that manner, and we walk in that truth. Do I need to scoot back, Ray? Maybe that'll be less squeaky for you guys. But he, this is a bold statement that's made in chapter 18 because we see that he held fast to the things of God, to the commands given by Moses. As he walks through these different di dynamics of his life, we can see in chapter 20 of 2 Kings that he kind of made some mistakes also. He wasn't a perfect king. He wasn't a perfect person. He kind of flaunted his, his values and his wealth and his power and his, all of his stuff to the Babylonian kingdom at one point. God disciplines him for that. But in the moment we're going to look at today, we see Hezekiah faced with a guy. The guy's name is Sennacherib. 
He's the Assyrian king, and he has a whole army coming up against Judah. He's already taken most of the northern kingdom, Israel, and he's coming around, and he's, he's basically at Jerusalem's door. And he is mocking God. He's mocking the people, and he's sending people out through the land to basically discourage them, to create pressure upon them. He's sending people out who are saying, hey, don't believe your king. Your king says that your God is going to save you, but look at every other nation we've already destroyed. Look at this nation. Look at this God. Look at this idol. Look at all of these things. And this nation that's coming against them is saying, we've already destroyed all of them. Why is your God going to stand for you? That's some real pressure. The whole nation is now looking, the southern nation of Judah is looking to King Hezekiah going, hey, what's going on? And we enter into this scene where a messenger has been sent to Hezekiah. And the message is this, back in verse 10 of 19, it says, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, Do not let your God in whom you trust receive you by promise that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the king of Assyria has done to all the lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered? And they go through some different people. This is written down on a message. It's brought to Hezekiah. And he has a decision to make at that moment. Is he going to fear this person, this guy, Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, or is he going to go to the place that he should? Is he going to turn and still trust God, even though the world is telling him, God can't do it. We've already laid waste to everyone else around you. That's a lot of pressure. Hezekiah is leading a nation. He's looking to the people, and the people are looking back at him going, what do we do? I don't have a whole nation, but I have four kids, and they often look at me and they go, Dad, what are we doing? Like, it could be a Saturday morning, and that feels like a lot of pressure, and I don't even have anything to do, right? It's like, what are we doing today? I don't know. Well, you're supposed to know, like, you're the head of the household. But yet, that seems so small, and yet on a Saturday, my heart sometimes still wants to do just what Scott wants to do. I don't necessarily want to lead my kids every single day, because my flesh is weak, my human nature is fairly strong in the idea of being lazy, not doing things I'm supposed to. There's a lot of pressure, and each one of us, we're, we're all chuckling, or most of us, because we know that that's our own heart. I'm not just talking about me. That's every one of us in the, our room. When we wake up each day, we have a choice. Am I going to pursue God, or am I going to pursue myself? In our story, we have two kings. We have Hezekiah who we read is stated to be a king that followed after God, and we have a king, Sennacherib, who is pursuing his own desires of destruction and basically overtaking the whole world. That's his desire. So we enter in now, verse 14 of chapter 19. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messenger and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eye, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the king of Assyria has laid waste to nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they are not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. The first thing he does is he takes the letter, he reads it, he received it and he read it, and then immediately, without even ending the sentence, it says, And Hezekiah went to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. He took the letter, he received the pressure, and the first response was not to try to think about it, go find his best advisors, go find his people, his wise counsel. The first thing he does is he receives the letter, he reads it, he acknowledges that there is pressure, and then he takes that pressure without missing a beat, and he goes to the temple, and he lays it, literally it's a written letter, he lays it out before God, and he looks to God and he goes, here's the problem. 
Right? If I was going to paraphrase this little chapter, this, is, this section of the chapter, Hezekiah receives bad news. Hezekiah lays it before the Lord and says, deal with it. Right? Because that's what we should do. It, it's not within Hezekiah's own ability to actually manage and fix this problem. Because, honestly, Judah's not the biggest nation that they had just conquered. When we read at the end, we're going to see how God handles the problem. But in the moment, we, I want to stop and look at Hezekiah's prayer. Right? There's lots of models of prayer throughout Scripture. You can go to the Lord's Prayer. In the New Testament, we can go through the ACTS, the Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. But I think Hezekiah is on to something here because it's a prayer of pressure. Right? His decision isn't like, you know, sometime in the next 10 years would be a nice answer. There's somebody knocking on his door, probably building siege mounds around his city, trying to get ready to take the city. It wasn't an active waiting moment. It was a moment of action, needing God to show up. And we see that at the very end. He says, so now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, from the enemy. Save us, please. That's the idea of his prayer. But when we start at the very beginning, he acknowledges the first step when we pray in, under pressure, when we're dealing with hard questions, hard decisions, we stop and we acknowledge that there is pressure. So often we can kind of go through life and just go, ah, there's not a problem. Oh, there's no problem, right? If you have a car and you see oil leaking out the underneath and you just never look under the car, then the oil's not leaking, right? Right, Dan? It would stop leaking if you just don't check it, right? The reality is, if you don't acknowledge the problem, it doesn't mean the problem's gone. It just means you're ignorant to the problem. You're ignorant to the pressures of our life. And so as we walk through this, the first thing we need to do is stop and realize we are faced with problems. We're faced with hardship. We're faced with pressure. We're faced with difficulty. And that's where the first step of prayer begins, acknowledging it and then making a decision. Who am I going to trust in? Am I going to be like the king Hezekiah or the king Sennacherib? Am I going to trust in my armies, my own ability, my wisdom, my knowledge, my capability? Or am I going to stop and go, okay, God, I'm going to lay this literally out before you. That's the second thing that Hezekiah then does. It says without missing a beat that he went to the Lord and he spread it before him. And it says he then prayed before the Lord saying, O Lord, the God of Israel enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of earth. You have made heaven and earth. Notice how he didn't start and go, hey, God, I got a really big problem. I got to fix this problem. I need you to solve this. Where does he start? He starts with adoration and praise. He starts looking back at what God is and who he is. Right? He realizes very quickly, the Lord, the God, enthroned above the cherubim, like putting it on a different plane completely. But he says, you alone of all the kingdoms of earth, like he's above all of them. And that he has made heaven and earth. He acknowledges God's authority to actually be over the problem. Right? He acknowledges there's pressure. He makes a choice. He goes to God and he doesn't just bring the problem and start chucking it at him. He goes, hey, fix this problem. He stops and goes, hey, I know that you're bigger than this. I know that you're far greater than this. I know that you're far stronger than this because you are the God who made heaven and earth. The land that this foreign king is capturing was land that you made. So he starts with adoration. So our first thing is acknowledging our pressure. Our second thing is acknowledging God's majestic power and authority over that pressure, over every situation. Let's keep going in verse 16 now. It says, Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. He now approaches God with the problem. He begins to lay it out. He's not a dumb king. He knows that God knows what Sennacherib's saying. Right? He just acknowledges that he's over everything, so obviously he hears everything. But he wants to, in his own heart, be able to lay it before God and say, hey, here is my problem. Here's the challenge that we're facing. But then he engages God in an interesting way, kind of adoration again. Because he, he appeals to God's holiness, and he says, look, the enemy is not just mocking us, 
The enemy's mocking you. He realized the problem was far bigger than just the nation's problem, that this was a testament from the world against God. So when we begin to acknowledge our problems, oftentimes it's not just for us. We need to acknowledge it from God's perspective. Does our pressure that we're under directly assault the character of God? Are we able to admit, right, if we're creating the pressure, right? In this case, Hezekiah is under pressure from other people. We could study through it, and as I was studying the passages around it, and Second Chronicles talks about it, many scholars would believe Hezekiah probably actually brought this on himself because of his flaunting of his pride earlier on in his life. There was a time where he was sick and God restored him and gave him time, but then most scholars would say this time frame of this war fits after that sickness within his last 15 years of his life. He wasn't perfect, nor was the nation of Judah perfect. Just because the king was leading doesn't mean everybody else was. He tore down many of the temples. He tore down many of these things. But we know that God disciplines multiple generations. And so here God is also redeeming those generations through Hezekiah. So in his prayer, he appeals to God's character. That's our third thing, appeal to God's goodness. As we enter into prayer, we have to admit our problem. We have to praise God And then we appeal to his good character. The things that we just stated as praise, we have to appeal to. God, they're coming against your nature, who you are. Verse 17 says, Truly, O Lord, the king of Assyria has laid waste to nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hand, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. This is a continuation of understanding that same problem. He's acknowledging that all the gods that had gone before, all the solutions that had been laid out before weren't actual solutions because they weren't real gods. We have to admit that our attempts to fix our problem aren't going to fix them if it's not based in God. We might get a, a, a season of goodness out of it, but it won't last. Right? Many of those nations that Sennacherib had already destroyed had probably been prosperous for years prior to that. But at that moment, they were no longer prosperous. Their wood and stone idols that were hand-carved did nothing but get destroyed. As we pray, as we seek God, as we come into his face, into his presence, we have to pray from a place of trusting his character, pray from a place of being in his character, but also be willing to confess or hand over our attempts to fix the problem. Confession and repentance, turning from our own ways and turning to God. It's the same thing that's required for salvation, that we repent, we turn from our sinful ways and we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the same thing we continue to do when we're under pressure, when we have hard decisions, when God brings job changes, when God brings family changes, when he brings hardship, things that we can't even see, things we can't even fathom. None of us could have figured out COVID or any of those things. And yet, I am confident God has showed up in so many ways. Our ministry on campus grew by 25 students during COVID because we were the only club getting together. We jumped through every single hoop they had, and we had to do a lot of distancing and a lot of things that were challenging, but God was still faithful. And that 25 is now that the school is fairly leveled out. We've added 20 more new students this last year, this last semester, because there's now momentum. We're seeing 30 and 40 students weekly walking with God. We can sit and go, I don't like the situation, and that's okay. No one is expected to love all pressure. But God does want us to come before him and and do verse 19. Save us, please. Because when we're faced with pressure, when we're faced with even making decisions for our kids, it seems silly to to say Saturday morning, I have to stop and pray and ask God what what he wants me to do because it seems so small and trivial, but he wants even those moments, the smallest moments of pressure because he is orchestrating a plan for his glory, for his purpose, not for mine. 
Isaiah steps onto the scene, and we're not going to read the whole passage. You can read it. It's, it's an awesome statement. There's some prophecy in it, but Isaiah basically had already said that Sennacherib's going to go back to his own land and be like, taken care of by his own people, and that he'll catch a whisper. Jump down to verse 32. This is God's response. Isaiah's shared some different things, and he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city or shoot an shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it by the way that he came by the same he shall return and he shall not come into the city declares the lord for i will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant david let's stop in verse 34 god makes a commitment that they're not going to come into the city and they're not even going to launch a single arrow like, that's a pretty detailed commitment. Like, God's like, I'll deliver you, and also you don't have to worry about anything coming over the wall. No siege mounds, no shield, nothing coming against you. Because God is so much bigger than our problems. When we walk through a proper prayer, God responds. Now, in this moment, it seems immediate for Hezekiah. It's a pretty quick response. I don't know how long it took Isaiah maybe to send the letter to him, but I'm going to give it within a week right? Hezekiah prays, lays this letter out, and I imagine he was praying every single day like this, right? That would be a really long process to write all that down, but we get the idea that his heart was right before God, and God says, I'm going to deal with him. I'm going to send him back the exact way he came, but the reason for God's response is not because Hezekiah prayed so perfectly. The reason for God's response is not because Hezekiah was such a godly person, The reason for his response was not because anything that people had done. Verse 34, it says, For I will defend this city, and this is God speaking, to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. We get this picture that God is going to save Judah, not because Hezekiah was a good king, not because of what... Verse 5 in chapter 18 said that he trusted in the Lord and did all this stuff. God was going to deliver him because God is good. God is mighty. God is loving. All the things that we could encapsulate in Hezekiah's starting opening prayer line, O Lord, the God of Israel enthroned above everything is where he, he goes. He is acknowledging God's authority over the problem. In the same way, we need to acknowledge that and acknowledge that God will deliver us not because we are good, but because he is good, because he is loving. We also see the picture that he says, for the sake of his servant David. At this point in history, David was kind of the the early representation of Christ, foreshadowing of Christ. God delivers you and me not because of David, but because of Jesus Christ, his servant his son who died on the cross. We can walk through pressure as we pray. The prayer brings us to a place of dependence on God. It might take day in and day out of praying through a pressure point in your life, dealing with a hardship, job change, health issues. It may take us through that, but we know that God is the one that ultimately will deliver. It may not even be in the tangible physicalness of this life, but his son's death and resurrection delivers us completely from all pain and suffering and takes us into the presence of God, the very near and real presence of God. Now, to to recap how God defended the city, verse 35, it says, And that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, there there were all these dead bodies. And Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and went home. He basically woke up and goes, Shoot let's go. Like, that's the paraphrased version, right? Like, God stepped in. He wakes up and goes, oh, yeah, I can't win with that, right? That's not even his whole army. That's just 185,000. God took care of the problem, right? More than likely, Hezekiah would have marched out after God told him he took care of the problem, collected whatever loot was left. They would have made profit off of it, and they didn't have to do a single thing, right? Is this a testament to Hezekiah? Or is this a testament to God's faithfulness? Many people in Hezekiah's life after this moment would have looked at him and probably said, that guy figured it out. He's the one that chased him off. 
But if he truly is who verse 5 of 18 says, my guess is he pointed back to God constantly. No, no, that was God. Like I went to bed, woke up the next morning, and the army was gone. Like that's the time frame. Our problems can disappear overnight when we give them to God. Now, is this a promise guarantee that God's going to go fight every single battle for us? Absolutely. Does it mean that every problem is going to walk away and be gone completely? No. Because the reality is we can look at the next chapters of 2 Kings and look at the rest of the kings that come after, and you'll realize very quickly that Judah was not saved. It was ultimately in Christ that that salvation comes. Right? There's a point where prophecy still came true, but for the moment, Hezekiah brought some peace by being a faithful, godly king. We can bring peace into our life if we are faithful, godly people. I want to look at one more passage. Romans 8 really hits on, on this idea for us today. Romans 8 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray, for we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This is Romans 8, 26 through 28. And there's more either side of this, but there's a reminder here in verse 26 that the Spirit, right? So God was helping Hezekiah in his weakness. That same God has sent his Spirit into each and every one of us who have received him. And that Spirit is promised right here in Romans 8 to help us in our weakness, to intercede on our behalf, right? We can try to model our prayer life after Hezekiah or after the Lord's Prayer, after all these things, but I want to encourage you to have the mindset and the heart of a Spirit-filled prayer life because the Spirit is the one that intercedes on our behalf. Like, we could get the best prayer going, and at the end of the day, that's still nothing compared to what God can pray because he's so much farther above us, but he still wants us to engage in that act. So as we think about this, be reminded, be encouraged that no matter the pressure, no matter the challenges that we face, God is with us. In verse 28, it says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. All things work together for good for those who love God. And then the last part is called according to his purposes. Have you begun to let him call you according to his purposes each day? Whether it's a Saturday morning, you literally have nothing to do. Have you stopped to go, Lord, what is your purpose for today? Lord, what is your purpose for this piece of my life? What is your purpose for this pressure? When pressure comes, we need to acknowledge that it's, it's a trial. It's a challenge we also need to acknowledge that God welcomes us to spread it out. Sometimes that means writing it down and laying it on the floor before God and letting him process it. Other times it means simply just praying, knowing that the Spirit is interceding on our behalf, inviting other people into that. So as we go, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to have a a song and invitation time. And I want to invite you guys, if you want, if you need prayer, if you have questions about who God is, you're not sure you're saved, or you just need prayer for that, I'm going to be up here at the front. Um, I would love to pray for you. I'm sure Ray would be more than willing to pray for you as well up here at the front. But if you want, during this invitational song, after I pray, the the worship team is going to come back up, and we're going to sing this song. I want to encourage us to stop and go, am I sharing my burdens with God truly? Right, because that's one of the greatest questions we can ask. Have I truly shared the burden? Have I given it over to God? Do I acknowledge his goodness? Or am I simply just kind of doing my own thing, hoping for the best? So let me pray for us, and we'll, we'll enter into that invitation. I would invite you up. Lord God, I thank you, and I praise you for how you lead us and how you direct us, how you guide our steps, and how you make yourself known. Lord, I ask that you would teach us and make us aware of your goodness and your character. Lord, help us to bear our burdens before you and to put those upon your shoulder. Remind us of your character. Remind us of your goodness. Lord, help us to be not pressured into making wrong decisions, but pressured into you to be on our knees, Lord, 
that we would not walk as though we have to be tougher when the going gets tough, Lord, but that we would actually be weaker to be more dependent on you and to see your glory. We just thank you and praise you. Amen. Scott and Natalie, you're going to come and share with us. They are part of, they are the Western Colorado, Colorado Mesa University. Oh, the whole family's going to come up. Woo! Uh, of, of the master plan. And they minister on the university campus. And so I'm going to move this farther out of the way. And they're just going to share some things with us. And then Scott's going to preach for us here. Not, not yet. We're going to sing some more. I said I got to have four hours or something like that. Um, no, yeah, we're Scott and Natalie Slade. This is our oldest, Daniel. And then our next is Lydia and then Joanna and James. And we've been working with an organization called Master Plan Ministries for the last almost 10 years here in April. We joined on in 2012. And we served for about six years over in Denver on the Auraria campus where we worked with college students on the Metro State University campus downtown Denver. And then here about four years ago, we moved back to the Grand Valley just with some rearranging of our staff team. And we were able to actually come back to CMU where Natalie and I both went to college and start working with students there. And over the last four years, we've seen a lot of growth in students. Uh, you guys might not realize it, but the campus is putting a ton of effort into growing the student population, not just building buildings around town, because that's the outside appearance. But that's bringing many new students. They're developing their graduate programs and different things like that. And there's just a greater opportunity each year to meet more people who are going into the world, who are going to be working in business degrees, engineering programs, different things like that, and have the influence into their lives to be able to share. And we found over the years, over doing ministry for 10 years, working with college students is one of the most kind of pivotal moments in their lives. Like a lot of people establish their friendships, their marriages, their friend groups, their career direction in college. Even if they don't use their degree, they're establishing people that they're going to be connected to for the next 10 to 20 years. And with that, they're also sometimes establishing themselves in what they're passionate about, whether that's sports, playing sports, watching sports, just being students, living their life, or it could also be getting into community and learning what it is to, to do and serve God, to live out the, the godly mission of being a Christian, somebody who walks with God daily, someone who is encouraged by his word, and someone who's investing in that. And so our goal as the campus is to kind of do three things. We, we strive to win people to Christ by sharing the gospel. We strive then to build them up, to kind of see them built up in Christ, teaching them how to study the Bible. Just this last uh, semester, we were doing a Bible study in our house where we were doing the inductive Bible study method, where we were sitting down going through the book of Mark and getting to share with students who, who is the passage talking about? It seems simple to think about, oh, well, I just read it and I know it's about Jesus and about this person. But many of the students coming into college today don't have that literacy of the Bible that when they look at it, you're like, so who's this talking about? And they're like, I have no idea. They genuinely don't know who the scriptures are about. And so we walk with them through that in a group setting. We can then sit in discipleship one-on-one -on -one where Natalie meets with girls during the week. I meet with different guys. And we get to sit down and answer questions and challenge them and press them into God and lead them deeper into his, his trust and who he is so that they can then take that and begin to grasp what God's plan is for their life and be able to hold that and look at it and go, it's not because my parents were Christians. It's not because this guy on campus says I should be a Christian. It's because I know Jesus Christ and I've received him personally and I get to go out and carry those things out. Um, I love, I have a student that I'm working with. His name is Alvin and he just this last semester started discipling someone for the first time by himself. Um, he had never discipled anybody. He became a Christian two years before he came to college. And I've been discipling him for the last two years since as a freshman. And this last semester, he... Invest in God. He really wanted to spend some time walking with God and then also leading somebody else in that dynamic. And so as we sat down at the start of the school year, he said, I'm going to pray for one person to invest in. The next week, he met a guy named Eli... And he goes, I think this is the person. And Eli kind of didn't show up for a few weeks. And then finally, Eli called him and said, hey, I really want to get together with you. You've been reaching out to me. And they've been sitting down each week since the fourth week of school last semester, all the way till now, sitting down each week, going through who Jesus is, looking at the book of John now. They're, they did our discipleship packet, the master plan encourages students to go through. And he's now engaging into the Bible 
and getting to walk with, a, with him through that. And it's so cool to know that God is multiplying multipliers, people who are taking it and going to the next generation. I don't have the time necessarily to meet with every student on the campus. There's almost 10,000 students. But as I meet with one who meets with one who meets with one, we see that multiplication. And that's the, the picture of being sent, that students then walk in a manner where they're sent out. They're sent out to their peer group, and they carry that on beyond college. So with that, we wanted to share also a kind of a fun opportunity for our family. Um, and we, have, we can share more information in the back afterwards. But Natalie and I have the opportunity to help co-lead a mission trip this summer with our kids. All of us are going to West Asia, um, and we can, we're going there to work with Campus Crusade for Christ, um, and they already have an established missions team in the country we're going to. Um, it is a strongly Muslim country, and so we're keeping kind of things wrapped up tightly just to, to preserve their ministry there. But we get to go for about four weeks, and we're gonna, or five weeks, and we're gonna be spending it there working on a local campus there, where we're gonna be taking a few students from our campus with us, as well as some other staff from our ministry, and we've never been to this country before. So one of the, the exciting things about this trip is that we get to go and see what God is doing for Master Plan as far as a partnership and a vision goes. So we can walk with those people, pray for them, get to see what it's like. And hopefully years to come, Master Plan can be continuing to bring more mission trips, more opportunities to continue investing in students. Because one of the, the greatest things we've found over the years is when students go across the world, even just for four weeks, and they see somebody else and they realize they may speak another language, but those people have the exact same problems as I do. They're worried about money, food, housing, clothing, and ultimately they're separated from God if they don't have that personal relationship. And so when we take students, they always come back with a greater heart for God. It's, it's honestly, the, the picture in my mind is always that of the Grinch. If you've seen that movie, at the end of the movie, his heart grows like a few sizes bigger. But that's literally what happens with us when we go on a mission trip, our heart grows a few sizes bigger for what God is doing because we've finally seen the need. And so we're taking students this summer for our family. Uh, our cost is about $24,000. Um, and as of to this uh, last Friday, we only need $8,800 more to go for our whole family of six. So it's been awesome to see God doing that. Um, if you would like to partner with us in that or would love to pray for us as we're going on this trip, or just get our newsletters in general. We have information in the back. You guys can come chat with us. But yeah, we just wanted to share that with you that there's an opportunity for you to be praying for students. We can give you their names. We have about three that are going and, and give you the opportunity to pray for them and pray for the other side of the world as we go this summer. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much.